Hi everyone, I'm Susan Mulvihill. Welcome back to my garden. Boy, here we are heading into the middle of September and the weather is changing like crazy. It's much cooler. We haven't had any frost yet, thank heavens, but we've gotten a lot of rain and it definitely feels like fall is in the air. Now I know you're just dying to know what this is. <laughs> This is part of an American cranberry bush or Viburnum trilobum. It's a native plant that's very hardy. We get gorgeous white lace cap flowers in the springtime. We've had berries for a few months that are turning this gorgeous red color. And these berries are going to feed birds during the winter months. So I just love this plant. But September is a time for some very important garden tests. So let's get going. Probably the most important thing we all need to be doing this time of year is keeping a very close eye on the weather forecasts. Like I mentioned earlier, we have not had any frost yet, but you better believe I'm going to put some covers around the garden so that they are ready at a moment's notice to cover any crops that aren't quite finished growing yet. One of the things I've been working on is getting our winter garden going. And as I mentioned in a previous video, we've got our hoop house in one location and it is going to be moved over two rows to cover these two raised beds. There's just one problem. If you look at the middle row, you'll notice I've got the tomato bed growing <laughs> and that certainly needs to be out of the way before we can move the hoop house. And then in this last row in the foreground, that's where my melons are growing. Fortunately, they are ripening, but those need to be finished growing before we can put everything in place. The good news is that one of the raised beds that is going to be covered by the hoop house was already empty. And that's because the previous crop, which was onions, had finished growing. So what I did was I started some seeds indoors. On the left, is Claytonia or miner's lettuce. That's those spindly little plants, but they are absolutely delicious. And then on the right is some different types of lettuce. You'll notice there are hoops over the bed with some bird netting, and that's to keep those pesky birds from munching on those lovely tender greens. I still have a little bit of room in the bed, and I'll poke in something extra there. Another plant that I started indoors from seed is kale. This is winter borer which is a very cold tolerant cultivar, so that's why I chose it. I've just started the gradual process of introducing the plants to the sunlight and temperatures outdoors, and that process is called hardening off. The way it works is for the first day you put them outside in kind of a sheltered area so they don't have direct sunlight for an hour, then you move them back indoors. The second day you put them out for two hours, bring them back inside, and so on. And so each day I'm increasing the time they're outside and the amount of sunlight they're exposed to. So by the end of a week, they are ready to go in the garden. The only problem is that I still can't move them out into the garden just yet because I'm waiting for the last of the melons to ripen. But something that's really important to remember if you're going to grow a winter garden is that you start the plants early enough so they have a good root system before the really cold temperatures hit. That way they'll do really well. I also started some spinach seeds indoors and as you can see they're still very new. They just germinated a few days ago but they'll also go outside. The big thing to remember with both kale and spinach is that they seem to be slug magnets. And you would think that slugs wouldn't be tough enough to make it through the winter months, but they think my winter garden is just delicious. So I wanted to show you something that my husband Bill came up with that is ingenious and it should work really well to keep the slugs away from the plants. I want to start out by apologizing for the background noise. My chicken Clementine is always very chatty in the morning and today is no exception. <laughs> And what you're looking at here might not look all that exciting, but I want to tell you about it. So when you go to garden centers, there is something called Cory's Copper Tape, and it's to keep slugs away. What happens is that the skin of slugs reacts electrically to copper, 
And so what I used to do was to use this paper tape that has copper on it and I would make little circles and put them around plants that were especially susceptible to slugs. The problem is that once they get wet they sort of fall all over the place and it just wasn't working. But I knew the concept was good. So I was telling Bill about this and he came up with a great solution. This is PVC pipe that's about three inches in diameter. And what he did is he took the copper tape, which has a sticky side to it, and wrapped it around this piece of PVC. And then he actually had some leftover small gauge copper wire laying around and so he wrapped that on just to make sure it stays put. So what happens is the copper is attached to the PVC. The PVC, when it gets wet, nothing's going to happen so it stays in place. So when I plant my kale plants especially, I am going to put this on the soil surface around the seedling and this will act as a barrier to keep slugs away. I might not have quite enough to do all of the spinach plants but I'm certainly going to experiment and at least do half of them with these because he made me quite a few of these and I want to see if it really works well. But I just wanted to show you what we're using this winter and we'll see how it goes. Now I've been mentioning the melons a little bit and so I wanted to point something out to you. In a recent video I commented on how melons will start turning a lighter color when they're ripening and you'll notice these are a lot lighter than they were a couple of weeks ago. It's amazing how quickly it happens. And the other thing I wanted to point out which is going to be very hard for you to see is that the melon is pulling away from the stem that it's attached to on the vine. And that is a dead giveaway that it's ripe. Let me show you a close-up of that so you can see what I'm talking about. Now in case you're wondering why there's bird netting over here, it's not because of birds. It's because we had some kind of a critter munching on some of the melons, which really irritates me. And so this netting is keeping it away. Okay, here's where the stem is attached to the melon. And if you look, you can see there's a gap in there. And so this one is ready to be picked. Oh boy. In my last video, I mentioned how I planted cover crops in some of my idle beds. This is a great way to improve the soil, especially a way to add extra nitrogen in it. You can see that these buckwheat plants are doing great. I plan to chop them down soon and let them decompose in the soil. Now my raspberry patch is probably looking a little chaotic, but that's just how it looks this time of year. I did a video earlier this year on pruning raspberries and which canes or branches to cut back at the end of the season. And it's the ones that bore this year that get cut down to the ground. But I don't cut mine down until late winter. Why? Because as long as these leaves have green in them, that means they're conducting photosynthesis. And that means that they're sending energy to the roots for next year's growth. So it's very important to just leave them in place. You have my permission to wait until late winter, and then you're going to cut back the canes of the ones that produced this year. The one exception to the rule is that if you're growing something like fall gold where it produces twice, you don't want to cut them back until next spring because you need to make sure that the cane is truly dead by looking for any little green sprouts or green tissue on the inside of the canes. So don't chop those down just yet. But the main thing is to let these continue to conduct photosynthesis throughout the fall and then cut them down to the ground in the spring or late winter. Another task that I hold off on this time of year is cutting back the seed heads on flowers. And that's because the seeds are an important nutrition source for birds during the fall and winter months. And so I'm giving you permission to do less work this fall. Some of the best flowers to leave seed heads on include Gloriosa daisies. Bee Balm, Black-Eyed Susans, Sunflowers, 
and globe thistles. They are especially popular with goldfinches. You might also be interested to know that birds love lavender seeds, so we don't give our plants a haircut until early spring. One of my coolest memories to share with you is to picture in the middle of winter with all kinds of snow all over the ground and seeing birds moving around within the lavender plants. So here we are, the dead of winter, and we can smell the scent of lavender. And it's just because of the oil that is on the seeds. Is that cool or what? I've been growing canna lilies in pots and in some of my flower beds for years. Did you know the bulbs are really easy to overwinter? I've shot videos on how to do this, which you can find by searching on my YouTube channel. But here's how it works. You let the plants get frosted, which seems backwards, but that's how it works. Then you pull them up, hose the dirt off the bulbs, let them dry for a day or so, then put them into a box filled with dry straw or shredded paper and move it into a dark area such as a basement. You check on them once a month to make sure there's no mold going on. You'll repot them in February. And let me tell you, even if the bulb looks totally dead, it will probably still be alive and send out new shoots. It's amazing. Overwintering them is really easy and it saves you a bunch of money instead of pitching them in the compost pile and having to buy new ones at a nursery. Now, speaking of overwintering, Another thing I like to do that with is pelargoniums, which are known as annual geraniums. They are super easy to overwinter, and if you look on my YouTube channel, you will see that there are a few videos about how to do this. But this is a great one that you can overwinter very simply and save a bunch of money. I also grow ivy geraniums in hanging baskets. And I have to be honest with you because I have tried overwintering them using the same method as for my zonal geraniums and I've had crummy luck. I tried something different last year and it worked great. All I did was trim back the branches about two weeks before the first frost just to make the plants more compact. Then before the frost, I stored them indoors in their pots in a bright area and kept them there all winter long. I watered them regularly and they did really well. So you might give that a try if you've had poor luck with the traditional methods. So just to clarify, canna lilies need to be frosted before you begin the overwintering process. Do not let your pelargoniums or geraniums get frosted before you bring them indoors. If you haven't ordered your spring flowering bulbs like tulips and daffodils yet, you'll want to do that ASAP so you get the best selection. They'll be mailed to you at the right time for your region. You don't want to plant bulbs while it's still reasonably warm though. Instead, wait until the temperatures drop more, like in late October, early November, but definitely before the ground freezes hard. I'm going to order some more camas lilies and martagon lilies, which I had never heard of until recently, and they look really cool. Remember to write in your garden journal. It's so important to note which plants or crops did well, which ones didn't, new varieties to try next year, problems you encountered, and so on. I always think I'm going to remember everything from one year to the next, but that's rarely the case. This is the journal that I use because you get to look at three years at a time in your garden to compare conditions and how things did overall. Okay, that's all for now. Remember to keep a close eye on the weather forecast as we head into fall. I hope you found this video informative and maybe you'll give it a thumbs up. And I hope that you'll subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thanks so much, everybody, and see you next time.